I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for about the administrative law case, Citizens to Preserve Overton Park, the Volpe. We usually just call this the Overton Park case. This is a US Supreme Court decision from 1971 about the scope of review of agency action. Now for my students, this is one of the most important cases or most famous cases in administrative law. It's in almost every administrative law casebook. In fact, some casebook authors refer to it as the Marbury v. Madison of administrative law. It's also associated with something called hard look review or the hard look doctrine. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end of this video, but you may want to connect this to other cases or um, lectures about hard look review. In, in your course. But overall, this is not, I know that every case book has some cases that are just for illustration and others that are really important, like they have a doctor named after them. And this is the latter. This is one of the cases that you really should pay attention to and really should know by name. So the big takeaway here is that the case is about the standards of review that are set forth in the Administrative Procedure Act in Section 706. When we have judicial review of an agency action, there's different types of kind of either judicial deference or judicial scrutiny um, that can be applied depending on the type of case. And so the most common is arbitrary and capricious review under 706-2A. Um, and the court uses this, um, what appears to be in its phrasing, uh, a lenient um, review, but applies it in a rather non-deferential way. And the, by the way, this case is about the approval of interstate highway construction right through downtown Memphis, basically, um, which would bisect a large park. And here is the secretary. This the agency in this case is the Department of Transportation or the and the Secretary of Transportation, John Volpe at the time, um, who authorized federal funding to complete a highway project for Interstate 40 in Memphis that would have run through this large public park. To um, put it in perspective, so we have this park. It's a lot. I mean, it's a few hundred acres, and it's right in the middle of Memphis. And I-40 was being this, remember, this is the era when we're completing the interstate highway system. I-40 runs east-west across the United States and kind of stopped at one side on the, of Memphis and picks up again on the other side. And this was about connecting the dots or finishing the highway. The secretary complied with the APA's procedural requirements and another statute, the Federal Highway Statute, in making his decision, it seemed. Um, the determination seems clearly not to be a rule, by the way. This is not rulemaking, just don't confuse it with promulgating regulations. So Section 553 about notice and comment rulemaking don't really apply here. And you can see in the map here that the city of Memphis has a highway, kind of a loop that goes around it. And the proposal was to run this stretch of I-40 through the city. Now, this type of decision is arguably adjudicatory in form, although we didn't have a hearing or adjudication. Why? Because it's an approval of a specific highway proposal, but there was no statute that required that the decision be made on the record after an opportunity for an agency hearing. And so the, uh, we're not talking about formal adjudication like we did in our social security cases, for example. State and local officials were required to hold some public legislative type hearings, not under the APA, but the other statute about highways. And they did that actually. So just keep in mind, not only does 553 of the APA not apply, that's notice and comment rulemaking, but all of the sections about formal adjudication, 554, 556, and 557 are also inapplicable in this case. And there's no due process issues here. We're not talking about a liberty interest or property interest um, of an individual individual that's at stake. So again, here's the map. And this is I-40 that runs across. And we had a loop that's 240 that goes around the city. And we were going to connect the middle part there. 
Now, um, here's our statute, and this actually is where this whole process hits a snag. The Federal Aid Highway Act of 1968 articulated a national policy to preserve parks. And so, at, well, at the same time, fostering highway development. And so it, there's an issue, right, that parkland, because you don't have private owners, if it's owned by the government, then we don't have some of the same eminent, eminent domain issues and we don't have to go through the hearings. And so the concern was that the government would have a perverse incentive to run highways through um, parklands. And so they basically built right into the Highway Act that we're going to, you need to find alternatives if at all feasible um, and instead of running highways through parklands. And the, there's a similar um, act called the Transportation Act of 1966. And both of these statutes use almost the same language to preclude federal funding for highways through parks, unless, and I put it in bold here, there is no feasible and prudent alternative and all possible planning to minimize harm uh, resulting from its use is undertaken. And again, you can kind of see in the map here um, where the proposed highway is. This is a nice zoom in of Overton Park. And you can see in the southern part there, um, they had athletic fields and kind of rolling hills. If you go further south, there's a golf course. And that northern section actually has a very popular zoo. Um, and there was already a parkway, a local like two lane road separated by an island in the middle. But this section in the middle, it was going to be the proposed six lane expressway to connect I-40. And so it would go through through the park. Now, um, it, the, keep in mind, there were a lot of players here. You have the state and local officials, and they all wanted this. So before Tennessee had applied for federal funding, state and local officials had, of course, determined that the location of the projected highway would be prudent. They wanted it to go there. Um, and, but there were some private citizen groups, we sometimes we call them NIMBY groups, not in my backyard, who didn't want a highway um, near their property because they thought it would affect their property values. And there were also some conservation or environmental groups that said we should um, not do this because it would sever most of the park, again, from this popular zoo. And they also worried about resulting pollution and traffic control and safety problems and the failure to invest in mass transit. So they wanted to kind of a, a, a deal with all these other things. Some of their counter proposals were a little far-fetched like building the highway somewhere else or digging this massive tunnel underneath the ent entire park and routing the highway through this long tunnel and so, and so forth instead of just connecting the dots by the shortest distance possible. But the responsible officials thought that the highway would ease traffic access to Memphis. And um, so in other words, if you kind of look at the map here, what was happening was um, through traffic that's trying to cross the uh, cross country on I-40 would get off the highway when they got to one side of Memphis and cross through Memphis on local roads. And this caused a lot of backed up traffic at, at stoplights and stop signs and congestion in general. And they thought they could get the traffic, the through traffic off the local roads and they would just uh, onto the highway so that it would just continue zipping on through. And in fact, the state of Tennessee had offered to pay Memphis $2 million in compensation um, for the loss of the par part of the park. And Memphis had, was excited about that because they were gonna, going to take that $2 million and buy more parkland. So the Memphis City Council and the Tennessee Highway Department and the Federal Highway Administration had all arrived at a collective judgment that there was no feasible or prudent alternative plan to achieve benefits that a highway through Overton Park would realize. So let's talk about the holding in the case, right? And so we've been talking about the park. And for those of you who are looking, what part of this case should I highlight? This case is a little confusing because the court goes through a whole bunch of alternatives um, that have, are proposed by the uh, litigants, by the plaintiffs, that they then reject. They discuss at length and then reject. So they really get to the heart of their decision here. And I have a quote when they start talking about 7062A and arbitrary and capricious review. So they say that 7062A requires a finding that the actual choice made was not arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with law. So that's the text of 706 right there. 
And, and then the court says to make this finding, a court must consider whether the decision was based on a consideration of the relevant factors and whether there was, has been a clear error of judgment. In other words, how if you, that looks very deferential, right? That the, we're supposed to defer to the agency unless it was arbitrary, capricious and abusive discretion or otherwise not in accordance with law. But how do you evaluate that? And that's what this case is really about. So the court notes that the secretary did not demonstrate that he had made formal findings or state his reasons for allowing the highway to be built. This was a simple authorization, right? He issued an approval notice instead of explaining in detail or including reports with it that they had considered all of these alternatives and had ruled them out as not really viable and so forth. Now, remember, this was a long process and lots of meetings. There must have been a lot of documents generated and reports and meeting minutes and so forth um, that were really part of the record of the decision-making process. What the agency learned kind of the hard way in this case is that they were supposed to produce all of that up front and reference it as the justification for their decision. The court continues, and I'm gonna quote them. The administrative record is not before us. The lower courts based their review on the litigation affidavits that were presented. In other words, the, um, uh, the agency, the, the Department of Transportation came in and said, well, we'll submit affidavits saying that we did consider all these other alternatives and there's no better way to do this than just, just go straight through the park. Um, but the court says these were merely post hoc rac rationalizations, which were, are an inadequate basis for review. In other words, you're not showing us the documents that the agency was looking at when it made its decision. Instead, you're telling us after the fact, you're giving us affidavits assuring us that you um, did a good job in making the decision. And so they don't constitute the whole record. And remember the Administrative Procedure Act in 706 requires that the review is based on the whole record of the agency's decision-making. So it's necessary to remand this case to the district court for plenary review of the secretary's decision. And that review is to be based on the full administrative record that was before the secretary at the time he made his decision. When you were a kid and you had math class, did you have a teacher that asked you to show your work, right? And they didn't want you to just answer the question on a test or quiz. They actually took off points if you didn't show your work. That's an, a kind of an analogy to what's happening here. The court is telling the agency, you don't get to just make a decision, a yes or no, and then tell us um, by affidavit that you really did think about it. We want you to show your work. You need to come into court um, and show us how you, the process, you had meetings on these days, you read these reports, everybody officially accepted these reports, you commissioned some studies, you considered these alternatives, and here are the five reasons that you ruled them out and so forth, show your work. And essentially, uh, uh, Overton Park is a, the court saying to the agencies, if you want us to defer to you, you have to show your work. Otherwise, we have no way of knowing that you didn't just flip a coin or um, throw a dart at a dartboard to make your decision. Now, I know that sounds unreasonable, right? That no one really thinks the Secretary of Transportation is shaking a magic eight ball to decide whether to finish highway construction. But the court basically wants them to uh, document things and show the documentation in the record. Okay, we're almost done here. By the way, as you read this um, very famous opinion, note that the court does something that is either clever or sloppy, depending on your perspective. They alternate between articulating substantive concerns, like has maybe the agency did something wrong, maybe they made a clear error of judgment, and procedural concerns. Was the decision based on a consideration of the relevant factors? So try to keep that straight in your mind, at least after the case. Don't let the case confuse you. There's a difference between asking, did the agency have a decision-making process that seems appropriate, like we can trust this process even if the decision, the final decision they made is not what we might have guessed or what we would have made. A substantive concern is when we're concerned that maybe the agency is doing the wrong thing. And arbitrary and capricious is supposed to be focused on the latter, 
right, on the process, but sometimes they get mixed together. Now, I have to say something about hard look review because Overton Park, this case has become associated with that uh, uh, um, doctrine or concept and you should know a little bit about it. I'll discuss hard look review in more detail in a separate video. But a very famous DC Circuit Court of Appeals judge, Harold Leventhal, later dubbed, uh, kind of coined the phrase, hard look review. And, um, and for initially this meant what the agency was supposed to have done. And when he, so the person who coined the phrase actually thought that Overton Park was an example of this or had endorsed this approach that the DC circuit had started to take. So here's how he originally understood hard look review. A reviewing court must reverse an agency action unless the agency shows it has taken a hard look at the salient problems and engaged in genuinely reasoned decision-making. In other words, if the courts are gonna have a role here in judicial review for agency decisions, right? They're not supposed to substitute their own judgment for the agency's judgment for the, the agency has more expertise. They're the ones that Congress entrusted with the power. But what we wanna say see is that the agency is actually doing their job, is working through the problems, considering all of the relevant factors um, that they've appreciated the difficulty and that there were alternative ways to do this and so forth. And they are demonstrating that they're putting putting on some evidence uh, to show that they took a hard look at it. So originally hard look review referred to the requirement that the agency take a hard look at the problem. Now, over time, the term has generally can, can come to convey the idea that the court is going to take a hard look at the agency's hard look, right? And, and whether the agency is decision and reasoning process, even though the court is ultimately not supposed to substitute its own preferences um, and, uh, and policies for the agencies. And if you're wondering what happened, here's what we have uh, to this day. We didn't ever run um, I-40 through this, it gets remanded to the lower courts and continues litigating until essentially the agency kind of exhausts its resources. So what they did was they put up signs that um, 240 is also I-40 on the Northern loop of the city. So what happens is so instead of going straight through like they had planned on the shortest distance, when you get to one side of Memphis, you basically get on I-40 to I-240 for a while and loop the city and then pick it up on the other side. Okay, and that concludes our lecture about Overton Park.